relating to wildlife and the implementation of a new non-resident annual fishing license pursuant to Assembly Bill 19 for use solely in the reciprocal waters of the Colorado River, Lake Mead, Lake Mojave, Lake Tahoe, and Topaz Lake. This regulation adds clar clarification language needed to implement this new license. Maureen? For the record, Maureen Hellinger, Nevada Department of Wildlife, and I, Commission, I am here to um, present CGR 398 LCB R025-11, the Interstate Boundary Waters License. I, as usual, I sent out a little white paper with the language just as a matter of background and, and explanation. I'll go over that a little bit and, and the language changes and then turn it back to you. Uh, during the 2011 legislative session, Assembly Bill 19 um, was proposed and proposed the Interstate Boundary Waters License and it was approved. This regulation, CGR 398, is to amend the current NAC in order to implement the license. The purpose of the license is to attempt to compete for non-resident fishing license sales along the border of Arizona, the Colorado River system, Lake Mead and Lake Mojave, to be specific, and along the California border, usable on the reciprocal waters of Topaz Lake and Lake Tahoe. And in the statute, it, it specifies the fee, at the base fee at $25. And then um, we also, as note, we have currently have reciprocal agreements with both states in the bordering waters so that either license, the Nevada or the respective state license, is, is legal when a person is fishing. So in the language exp explanations, section one is just basic housekeeping language that introduces what chapter is going to be amended. Section two deals uh, with NAC 502-285 and is the section regarding the reciprocal waters of the Colorado River, Lake Mead, and Lake Mojave. And as you'll note in the documentation, subsection B is being amended to include the, the Nevada Interstate Boundary Waters License. Section 3 amends NAC 502-286, and that is regarding the reciprocal waters of Lake Tahoe and Topaz Lake. Subsection B again amends, is being amended to include the Interstate Boundary Water License. Pretty straightforward. Um, we hope to implement in the next license year, which starts next March, with the sales becoming available in February. So I'll turn it back to you for any questions. The uh, commissioners have a question for Maureen on the uh, on this particular uh, CGR. Uh, Commissioner McNinch. This isn't going to create like waves, so to speak, or, or uh, problems with our neighboring states trying to draw people in, is it? I mean, are, is it going to create yes. friction? It's going to create competition. We're going to take back the license will, sales will, will that we they, lost to them. Will they take it as competition, or is it going to create problems? I've talked to the other directors. They know that it's coming. And not a problem. I can remember this subject in Las Vegas probably four or five years ago and my understanding is it created waves because they came and did it to us. We're just getting I understand I understand that our license agents in Las Vegas are selling to Nevada residents this interstate water license cheaper and we can sell our own license so we're losing revenue. That's why we proposed the legislation to provide an alternative for our residents or California residents that want to fish Nevada water they can come by this and it's actually the same price as what a resident would pay for a uh, fishing license, statewide fishing license. So, and it gives you Tahoe and Topaz, which the other licenses don't. They just give you. So it's a marketing strategy on our part. Understood. I just wanted to be able to sit at the table with other items to still be able to have a civil discussion. At Wafwa. <laughs> <laughs> or wherever. Or wherever. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd be okay. Okay, any any other commission comment? Um, uh, let's take it out the public comment and see if we get anybody from the public has any questions on this, uh, on the agenda item 11B, uh, CGR 398. Come on up, Gil. <laughs> we discussed this at our Gil Carson Advisory Board. Uh, we realize this is strictly a monetary issue, and we think it's fair is fair. You know, whatever we want to throw back, we can beat them. Okay. Any other public comment? 
Okay. Bring it back to the commission. Anybody have any uh, anything else to add to, uh, for this particular agenda? Item? Okay, seeing none. Let me move on to uh, agenda item 11C, Commission General Re Regulation Number 400, LCB File Number R054-11, Commercial Crayfish, Flaying of Fish, Restrictions, Import, Transport. Chief of Fisheries Mark Warren. Um, commission may adopt a regulation relating to wildlife. Authorizing the commercial taking of crayfish without the imposition of demerit points under certain circumstances. Authorizing the importation, transportation, or possession of a certain species of shad. Prohibiting the importation, transportation, or possession of a certain species of eel. Authorizing a person to obtain a permit to take crayfish commercially from the waters of Lake Tahoe under certain circumstances. And authorizing the filleting of fish before transport under certain circumstances. Um, Chief Fisheries Warren. Yeah. Uh, Chairman McBeth and fellow commissioners, for the record, Mark Warren, Chief of Fisheries. Uh, this reg has uh, several parts, so I'll try to cover them uh, one at a time. Uh, first, I'll cover the crayfish. Uh, uh, there's a person in the audience, Mr. Fred Jackson. He came before the commission last year and uh, requested that uh, we look at opening Lake Tahoe up to the commercial taking of crayfish. Presently, at that time, it was closed for the state. You could take them as an individual, but you couldn't take them commercially. Uh, we took a neutral stance on it. Uh, we felt that the crayfish, uh, a lot of people feel they're not native to Lake Tahoe, and their population has been estimated in the millions. And uh, we realize they're part of the food chain. So we kind of took a neutral stance. Uh, the commission approved uh, us to go ahead and pursue this. So. Um, that would mean that, uh, that that he could he or anybody else could apply for a permit uh, through us and commercially harvest crayfish at Lake Tahoe. Um, on our permit, we can put stipulations, and uh, Mr. Jackson also knows that um, not uh, just being passed by us. He also has to go through TRPA and uh, state lands, and they have some uh, rules for. Um, commercial taking of crayfish up there as far as buoys and whatnot. So it's kind of the first step uh, in many that uh, he'd have to go through. Uh, the second one is uh, shad. Um, we have on our prohibited species list a gizzard shad that uh, we will not allow them in Nevada. What happened was they got down to Lake Powell, which is upstream in the Colorado River system. Uh, they slowly just moved down and um, they uh, we have threadfin shad already in the lake. Uh, both species are introduced there. They're good forage for things like stripers. Uh, when the gizzard shad move down, the anglers go out and they use the cast nets and, uh, and, and catch them and then use them for bait. And so we, were, we, we faced the dilemma of uh, uh, people using a prohibited species uh, to catch fish. Well, when they're little, when they're fried, they look so much alike we couldn't it's really hard to tell the difference. Even well, I've never even seen either one of them. So, but uh, the people that are down there says it's very hard to tell the difference. So, uh, I met with uh, uh, Chief Bonamici, and, and we kind of decided that we wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't uh, ticket anybody for that, because they're so hard to tell apart. And that we would go ahead with this regulation that would allow people. So, it'd be taken off the prohibited species list, and then people can legally use them for. Um, for bait. Uh, the third one is the flaying of fish. Uh, Cameron Waitman in uh, LE has uh, over the years got several complaints from anglers. Uh, if we have a regulation at a reservoir and say uh, the bass must be 14 inches in length, uh, you couldn't fillet the fish and leave the carcass there and take it home because when say a warden stopped you on the way out there's a check station, uh, he looks at it he can't tell you know if those are legal bats or not. So it kind of played with it a little bit and it was it said it would go ahead with you could uh, get the fish and fillet them but you had to have the carcass with you. So that would preclude people from catching undersized fish. So they could be filleted and then you just have to throw the carcass which would consist of the head, the tail and the bones away when you got home. Uh, Cameron also uh, did some research um, for the prohibited species list, there's this little critter called an Asian swamp eel. Again, I haven't ever seen one. 
Um, they uh, have been imported into America, mostly in the South. Apparently, uh, they've gotten out. People have them in their aquariums. They leave town. They don't want to get rid of, you know, Fifi or Fufu or Ralph or whatever they named it, so they throw it in a body of water. And then it, you know, takes over. We've seen that with a lot of uh, fish around the state, including tilapia and Lake Mead. And it eats whatever's there that's native, and uh, it's just an invasive species. Uh, I read a little bit about them before this, and they're in Georgia now, and uh, in one of the islands, Hawaiian Islands, and in Florida, they're really causing a lot of problems. A lot of states are going ahead and putting this critter on the uh, prohibited species list, which would mean, you know, you can't have one. So those are kind of the four parts. Okay, anybody, any of the commissioners have any questions of uh, Chief Warren? Um, Commissioner McNinch. Don't go anywhere. Okay. The crayfish, the commercial collection or harvesting of crayfish. Right. Are we setting up our setting ourselves up for another Sacramento blackfish situation? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, for those of you that don't know what happened with the blackfish, uh, we permitted a person uh, to take them commercially in Lake, Lake Lahontan, and then other people wanted to apply, and uh, we just had a, oh, it was it was just. Uh, it was lawsuits. Uh, yeah, it was lawsuits, actually, and, uh, you know, in order to limit the number of people. So uh, right now we do the permitting. And um, the only thing I can say is we'll just have to wait and see. Um, it, it could happen. I mean, I don't know. You know, that there might be only a couple. It might be a small operations. Uh, it could be that we would, you know, have to re revisit it and look at a lottery or something. I don't know. There, and there might be some differences. I mean, with the Sacramento, with the, the, the previous situation we had, it was a species that other uh, game species fed on so it was a food source for those so that's how the, the take was monitored and was right depending on how you know and that's that was one of the reasons does the same thing apply here do, do they create fish or they they provide food for any of the sport fish well sure they do uh -huh. the different uh, you know the small ones of course you know if you're a fisherman you know that small crayfish are great bait uh, when they molt they're soft and uh, then they become uh, desirable by fish um, the, the papers I've read, there's there's just a whole lot of them in there, you know, so much so that uh, from a biological standpoint, it would probably be hard to make a dent in the population. Do you do you believe that there's a, a point where if it got fished out, it would be a problem? Uh, it could be, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So we're, but I so think we, it would so take I think it would take a lot to fish them out, you know. Well, if Mr. Jackson's efficient at it as he probably would like to be at, I don't know. We, we hear, we hear, you know. Well, I'm not going to endanger the resource that I'm trying to, to take advantage of because that'll be my livelihood, or that's right. But somewhere along the line, we're going to get somebody else that wants to cut the cut of the pie, and then somebody else, and then somebody else. Now we're talking how much each one can take and how we do that, and it and it becomes a it gets complicated as you know. oh it does yeah it became very complicated with the blackfish and we tried to estimate the the population size of course the fluctuates so much that you know when it's up and you had a couple of good years there's you know several million and then when it you know it holds 300,000 acre feet of water when it gets down to 6,000 all the blackfish are gone and so there's not as many so it's important to preserve the blackfish so that they can provide forage for the game fish. So it's a real balancing act. The Tahoe doesn't, of course, have those fluctuations, but it, uh, you know, it's, it's a possibility. And uh, something we'd, you know, have to uh, maybe relook at later, reinvestigate later. Chief Warren, my, my recollection of the presentation that was done before and, and Commissioner McNinch and uh, Commissioner Drew and Commissioner Rob weren't there. But my recollection was is that we th th this this population is growing and the numbers were just so great and were causing water quality issues and uh, and that I, when I left that when I left that informational item I got the feeling that there was very little that impact that this could have in other words I don't know if this would ever be fished out given the numbers that we we were talking about that it was a very, very substantial, you know, yeah. progression, increase in population yeah, of these crayfish. Yes, yeah, I mean, they're one up from insects, but still, you know, there's a zillion insects that birds eat. 
and you know they're not as high up as, as a fish but uh, a lot of people um, have looked at it in that you know there's there's a native uh, mineral population like Tahoe uh, red-sided shiners tui chubs and whatnot that the fish also feed on and that the crayfish prey on the eggs of the minnows and so it, the mineral population has actually decreased over time so some you know the, Biology is, it takes a lot of investigation and, and sometimes we just have to speculate, but um, and the mineral population might actually increase with the decrease in the crayfish. And they are uh, not indigenous, right? The crayfish? Uh, the, the, yeah, for the most part people, would, you know, there's no really records, but um, most people think that they're, they were introduced. Same with the Truckee River. And the beaver population, same thing. There's all this controversy about whether the beavers are native or not and the crayfish are native, but most people say they're not native. Okay, Commissioner Rain. Thank you. Legal question. The $500 fee, do we have the authority to do that? If so, where do we get it from? As I know with other fees and things, we have... So if you can and just go over that for us. Uh, I would if I if I knew the answer. Uh, we must have some <laughs> legal grounds for that. <laughs> so we may or may not go to prison for doing this. Isn't that the standard commercial license fee for any commercial taker? Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is this is a fee set forth by state standard by state law. We don't have any authority. I mean, could we make ten, two bucks or ten thousand? Do we have authority, or is this it? And it's set by state law. I don't yeah, it's the the fee is set at five hundred by state law somewhere. NRS. Legislated for commercial payment. I just thank you, Marie. I, I, it's <laughs> Marie Hollinger for the license office. It's set in NRS. That was my question. Thank you. All right. He truly like answered. He a fish head. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We defer, we defer to the financial section when it comes to uh, other things. <laughs> Thank you. He threw you to the wolf, Mark. I, I, I did. Marine saved me. Any other uh, commission uh, comments, questions? Okay. Uh, go ahead and take us out to the public. Uh, Gil? We had a Gilliana Carson Advisory Board. We had a lengthy discussion on this and we were lucky enough to have some people from Endow and uh, we asked some questions like since most of this crayfish taking will be done at night we were concerned that we would start hearing from people who live on the expensive property around the lake complaining about noise lights stuff like that and they and we were said really Endow does the licensing they set the rules and the license holder has to agree to those rules or he doesn't get the license. The other thing that we were concerned about was the petition from no crayfish catch Nevada.org. No. <laughs> come on, come on up. Chair Macbeth, uh, the rest of the folks on the commission, I'm Fred Jackson. I'm the petitioner. Um, for the folks that weren't here for the presentation, the very first time that I showed up here, it's a, been a long process. It's been about eight months since I spoke to you guys. In 1970, there was 50 million crayfish. Now, just before that, Sweden had a scourge come through and kill all their crayfish. They came to Tahoe, and we delivered crayfish to Sweden to repopulate their populations with the crayfish that came out of the Klamath Basin, which these crayfish came from, Southern Oregon, Northern California. Um, the first introduction, written introduction, that Dr. Sudeep Chandra could find was in 1895 at Marlette. Second introductions are in the early 19th century and then a couple times in the 30s and then on from there. Now, at that time we had Lahont and Cutthroat. Those cutthroat did feed on those crayfish and the minnows in that near shore environment. We didn't have the population explosion problems that we have that we're experiencing today. Uh, to, to make a long story short, we went from 50 million in 1970 to 200 million in 2002. That's the estimates that Dr. Chandra and his environmental team sampled in the lake itself. If that holds true to today, we're up over 300 million crayfish. 
Now those crayfish have locked in their systems phosphates and nitrates. They produce 5% of their body weight in waste. That's 22 million pounds of body waste going into that nearshore environment that acts just like a fertilizer. Those, that invasive vegetation, the algae grabs a hold of that and grows just like in your garden. And with the clear water that we have, we've got the same problem in Mason Valley. We've got exclusive nitrates coming out of that hatchery from those fish going into Hinkson Slough. The vegetation explodes, it becomes a carpet. You can't even fish Hinkson. This is what's happening basically in a broader picture at the lake along the near shore environment. Now we have concerns of fishing at night. I've been up there in my boat. We set the traps on the bottom. We actually sink the traps with a float, with floating ski rope line basically is what I can tell you. Those traps go 18 feet down. That bobber sits three foot above the trap. There's no navigational hazards at that point. There's also a way to trap with 20 traps in a line. You drop 20 down deep and you float. You could drop it 160 feet if you wanted, as long as that bobber stayed 20 feet down. You could see it. You could grab that whole trap system with no navigational hazards. Now, we've got over 300 million crayfish in the lake. They're within the near shore environment all the way to 40 meters. They'll migrate back and forth during the winter during storms so they don't get beat up and die in that near shore environment. So they migrate out. I'm just asking for a small area. I'm asking for a small area to do a clarity study. We're going to take these, instead of going as an invasive species business, per se, I want to take this stuff, instead of burying it in a mort pit and going that route, give it to the community. Boost this economy. Uh, 2008, uh, Ilton experienced the economical downturn that everybody else has here, too. They lost their crayfish festivals, basically what you call it, to Redding. Redding bought it. It was a, a horse raising outfit for wild horses. They bought their deal, took it there. This was the first year they were able to bring it back to Ilton. The numbers aren't there yet, but in 2001, they sold 22,000 pounds of crayfish in a Father's Day weekend. They had 375,000 people show up in a population of 900. We're, we can set this up as our own local cuisine. We can bring that population to here. Now, sure, we've got people that live along the lake, but then you have the people that want Tahoe Blue. It's got, there's got to be a balance somewhere. At least give me two years. Give me two years to do this. I'm not asking for an exclusive. Anybody can do this. I just keep pushing forward. Everybody can do the same thing I can. It's just I, I've met with a lot of people. I've met with John Esquaga's people. I've met with wholesalers. They think it's a great idea. Harris wants to do it at the lake. They want to have their own festival up there. They say they can draw in hundreds of thousands of people. Look at what we can do for this community. There's a lot of things in the background that I'm working with UNR on on this project, and and Endow can lead the United States in the clarity issue, along with myself and my team. I just think it's a great idea. It's a win-win all the way around. It, the navigational hazard's been taken care of. I've talked to the Coast Guard, I've talked to TRPA, I've met with state lands, the Army Corps of Engineers, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Forest Service. They think it's a great idea, but they don't know how to write up the permitting process because it's brand new, just like our agency. It's brand new. But we got to try it. We, we got to give it a shot. You know, I think it's a great, great thing. It's a win-win for everybody. And that's basically what you can ask questions or. Okay. Um, <clears throat> some of us had the benefit of having the doctor come, and he t did substantiate. Uh, you know, I, I do recall that. Uh, you know, he uh, he's been studying this this, this issue, and uh, it just seems to me that it it can't hurt. Uh, that we've got you know some potential issues coming down the road on these crayfish in Tahoe. Um, Go ahead. I'm certainly open to, to taking crayfish out of the lake. That's not my problem. I think I think as we go along, we need to take take advantage of lessons learned in the past and set our administrative process up in such a way that we don't end up in the same mess that we did last time. If that's where we're headed, because that that was a that was a mess, and um, you know there there were impacts to people. Um, we wanted to do the same thing, and it um, created a, a big time sink for the agency. Um, Attorneys, a lot of money. The commission spent a ton of time on it, and um, I, I would hope that it, uh, we move forward. That we're able to, to take the things that we learned from that situation and fix it administratively somehow. I'm not sure what that means, but that that would be my hopes. So. 
Okay, but you don't see it as a reason not to do it? No. Okay. Okay. Unless, unless, unless it's going to create a massive problem. And I think, because I think that there's some administrative issues. I'm certainly, I'm all for biologically keeping the lake sound, um, making sure that, you know, that there's, there's some, there's some issues there for sure. You know, and those, those are of concern. Um, and I don't want to leave here and then, uh, and then two years from now talk about, um, how, how the population is tanked and we've got a, a sport fish that's without food. May I speak? Pardon? May I speak? Sure. There's been an introduction of the mice of shrimp in Lake Tahoe. Okay. There was a study done 10 years ago that the fish that actually feed on the crayfish at now, the edge class is 24 and a half inches or larger that will come in and feed on these, these smaller crayfish. Now, there's crayfish down in the lake all the way from the minuscule size age class up to 13, 14 inches long. Those are down at 120 feet. Um, it's amazing. We, we can't pass this up. This is huge. 300 million crayfish, all we can do is manage them. We're not going to deplete them. There's no, there's, that's almost impossible. And that's why it has to be done right, and that's why I'm here today. It has to be done right. We just can't go at this just poking a stick in the dark. It's got to be done correctly. Mr. Shrum? Mr. Jackson, are you planning on using just one small bay or a series of bays, or, or how do you? You know, I've discussed this with Dr. Chandra, and uh, we're going to target an area, let's say Crystal Bay. And we're going to stay in Crystal Bay, and we're going to do it, take clarity, the issue, you know. We'll put the traps in, do what we can, and see if we can actually improve the clarity in the bay in an area. It, this isn't going to be a shotgun all over or this would, this isn't going to work. This is this is this is a clarity issue. Um, we want to take a small area and just see if we can knock back that algae growth through the removal of the crayfish which will stimulate the minnow growth which will keep the crayfish from eating the minnow eggs. It's 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 a pretty pretty scientific process. It's going to take some time. Now, I talked to California fishing game they say if we can show an improvement in the next two years, that they will open up the California border on their side to the commercial take of crayfish. That's how they believe in this. But they want Nevada to go at it first and see what we can get. Are you be checking these Sounds traps? like risk management to me. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> will you be checking these traps every night? Yeah, my team will be out there. I mean, just like any other trap team, I've got, I've got to sit down and... and uh, decide I mean we're gonna pull them twice a night the reason I, I said at night we have less boat traffic um, the light issue isn't going to be a problem there's not going to be big lights like you see on the shows on TV it's not going to be that way everything will be submerged you know GPS spots all that stuff what's your time frame for say running your your whole trap line running the trap line I couldn't tell you that because we've only been on the water recreationally just to test our theories and what we what will be used and what kind of traps? I've got 11 different styles of traps. Some didn't hold any crayfish. Some held a few. Some held minnows. Some didn't. It's just uh, we're just trying to see what works best for the environment. And we're not going to use bait that puts nutrients back in the water. Initially, we will. Initially, we'll use bass, tilapia, whatever we've got available to us at the time. But once we trap, we're going to use crayfish. No bass. Pardon? No bass. No bass. No. 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 Okay, and so, okay, um, any other questions? Uh, okay, um, so Chief Warren, just a question for you. Sure. Uh, will the permit take into account uh, some of the things that have been mentioned here, geographical location, sure. you know, any other the specifics? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, ask him where he's going to trap and, you know, get the, the exact procedure, uh, what, what he's going to use and whatnot, and uh, we'll work on some of the rules that you have to follow okay, and then, for being up there. And if, if any of these other issues start surfacing, we can... Uh, yeah, we'll certainly, yeah, we'll certainly the see The department how will have, through their permitting process, should have the ability to put a hold on things until things are addressed, I would think. Right, just yeah, just, just to see how this one... You know how this one turns out, and then we can, you know, see how many others we get. Sometimes you don't know on these things until you, do you know until you do them, and uh, um, 
We'll just have to wait and see. Okay. Any Fred, others? I just want to say that uh, Fred was a Marine Corps recruiter before he joined the Department of Wildlife. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other uh, questions from the commission? Okay, then let's um, move on to um, 11D, uh, Commission General Re Regulation Number 401, LCB File Number R056-11, Classification Reptiles, Fur-Bearing Game Bird, Chief, <laughs> Chief Game Warden Rob Bonamici. Uh, the Commission may adopt a regulation declassifying the red fox as a fur-bearing mammal, classifying the Eurasian collar dove as an upland game bird, classifying the rosy boa as a protected reptile, providing for the possession, transportation, importation, and exportation of certain wolves without a permit or license issued by the Department of Wildlife. Chief. Uh, for the record, Chief Game Warden Rob Bonamici. Uh, starting out, the first issue that's addressed is NAC 503.025, <laughs> uh, which defines uh, fur-bearing mammals, which species are included, and it strikes red fox from the fur bearer list. And then moving on to section two, NAC 503.045, uh, game birds are classified as upland game birds, which include, and it's got a list there, and it adds the Eurasian collared dove to that list. NAC 503.080, uh, the following reptiles are classified as protected, uh, and we've added the rosy boa to that list, which is a, a snake uh, found in southern Nevada primarily. And then NAC 503.140 uh, is amended. Uh, section 1. Uh, except as otherwise provided in subsection 4 of NAC 503-500 to 503-5.35, inclusive, the following animals may be possessed, transported, imported, or exported without a permit or license issued by the department. What it does is when we get to sub R, wolves, it uh, specifies that are lawfully acquired and bred in captivity. So it does not include any wild form. And then um, page seven, as used in this section, aquarium fish includes, and here's a situation where we referenced an encyclopedia, a reference, and that is outdated now. So that's why we went away from that, as LCB suggests in those type of situations. So we struck that reference. And then what we did was uh, added sub one, not used as bait for human consumption, as a portion of the definition for aquarium fish. And two, maintained for personal or pet industry purposes in a closed system that does not allow species of fish to exist in aquarium or pond, et cetera. So that covers that. And then in B, the wolf includes any wolf or subspecies or hybrid of wolf as used in paragraph. In this paragraph, hybrid means any canid hybrid resulting from the mating of a wolf and dog. So with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay, any questions from the commission? Chairman McMahon? Yes, go, go for the record. Yes, go ahead, Hank. Uh, Rob, when it comes to the fox, he would just be he would be removed as a fur bear and what would his status be just a uh pet? No, it'd be the status would be unprotected. So you can take him any time of the year without a problem. Correct, but not by trap. There's, you, trapping is specific to, you need a trapping license and so forth to set a trap. But as far as with you a... trap them at any time. 
Or you'd have to trap them during the season. You'd have to trap them during the season. You have to have a trapping license. Uh, and there, there's death on sage hens and any birds that, that are around. I mean, they're they're darn on efficient predators, and they're pretty hard uh, to deal with. We had a couple passes of them here, and they were a mess. They just about cleaned the sage hens out several miles around here. Correct, and that's one of the reasons we're removing them as fur bear. Well, I understand that, but I, I, it, it, it's troublesome that only that the uh, wildlife services can set traps for them. If they are a farmer, uh, I'm not sure I understand why it would be uh, against the law for for anybody that with a with a trap to catch on this darn thing. It, uh, perhaps you misunderstood me. It's not against the law. It would not be against the law to trap them. All I'm saying is a private citizen, not wildlife services, but a private citizen would need a trapping license to set a trap in the ground. Okay. But I could trap them any time, or I would only be able to trap them during the trapping season? It'd be any time. Okay. Thank with you. a trapping license. Thank you. Is the rule any different uh, than for... Coyotes. No. Same. Same, same rule. rule. Same rule. Okay. Um, go ahead, Commissioner Wallace. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, what's the thought process behind the Eurasian dove? The thought process behind that is their range is expanding. Uh, they're mostly found in our cities and so forth, but their range is expanding, and we're just concerned that people are going to be mistaking them for morning dove. And we're going to run into issues with people saying they're hunting Eurasian collared doves that are currently unprotected and actually killing mourning doves. So what we're thinking long term is, you know, potential season on them that would be uh, coincide with the mourning dove season and, you know, whatever we decide you know no limit on them or what have you but just so we don't aren't putting people in a situation where they're shooting the wrong thing and violating the law uh, commissioner rain uh, thank you a couple questions um one on one back on the uh fox issue i think i understand all the stuff just don't we have an nac that has a list of unprotected species we don't have a list for unprotected species under NAC. Do we, and we, we strike this off here, don't we have to re-insert insert it somewhere else? No, basically, if, Anything if it's not, not on the list? Flat, if it's not classified as something that's unprotected. Okay, thank you. And then, um, I guess Rosie Bow. I'm just not familiar with that. It must be a very elusive snake that's somewhere in the south. And I, yeah, yes. Snake people I know, nobody heard of. Well, our, uh, Diversity biologists are concerned about it from the standpoint that that's exactly correct. It's, it is rare, and that's why they want to protect it. Uh, you have something that rare, and you don't want to open it up to commercial taking or incidental taking or what have you. You want to let the public know that, yes, indeed, it is rare and it is protected. Okay. My understanding of the dove situation is these doves are somewhat are somewhat of a pest in many places. I mean, it's not around where I'm at, but I'm given to understand that they are very much pests in many places. And therefore, you know, I, I would worry about um, being overly protective of a species that's not uh, native to the area and could be a pest. So. Even though they are somewhat similar in appearance, I understand that they are sufficiently different that a reasonable bird person can figure that out. I mean, you know, you can tell the difference between a chucker and a hun. They look like alike, but you know, you can figure it out. So what's the, why is the problem with leaving them the way they are? We're not hurting species by leaving them the way they are. No, we aren't hurting the species by leaving them the way we are. You're correct, and also because we make them an upland game bird, classify them as such does not preclude us from a year-round season if that's the desire of the commission down the road or what have you but again we come back to the identity issue with people mistaking them for morning doves and so forth 
And if and right now, if somebody mistakes them, they're well, you're harvesting a bird out of seasons. Game Correct. wardens have remedies for that to further educate those individuals in how to uh, identify birds utilizing um, citations, I believe, right? And that's the way it'd be done right now, right? Correct. So there is a current remedy on, on hand. Okay, um, I know we've talked about wolves um, extensively somewhat in the past about, about instituting different rules on wolves, and this is just wolves that are lawfully... So you'd still be able to have a wolf. You'd still be able to have them in captivity. Um, why aren't we being more strict than this? Right now, we're just addressing those in captivity and yeah. want to make it real clear that what you're authorized to have in captivity is not the wild version. It's a hybrid. So, and it's bred, or it's bred in captivity. Uh -huh. So that's what we're striving at here is just clarifying that language so people aren't under the misconception that we would allow somebody to go out and tra live trap a wild wolf if you even could, I don't know, uh, and then, you know, reduce it to captivity. So it's just clarifying what we have here to make it clear that these wolves need to be lawfully acquired and bred in captivity. And you aren't going to go out in the wild and capture them and convert them to a captive critter. So that's all that's for. Okay, and not to ask on every single subject, but I guess to ask on every single subject. Aquarium, fish. When I looked at the um, verbiage on there, it says not used as bait or for human consumption. Um, I've been around people in other places that utilize basically everything that moves for human consumption. <laughs> so, I, you know, depending on necessarily your um, country of origin and your uh, custom eating habits, that one is definitely left up to some major interpretation. You know what I mean? <laughs> I, I see your point, but also the word and is used as opposed to or. So, if it were or, then, yeah, not used for bait or human consumption, you'd be 100% correct. But with the word and in there, it's got to be meet both those criteria. So it's not used for human consumption and as well as being maintained in a closed system. Hmm. I'm following you. Uh, just one question on the wolves, wolves uh, issue. Um, are, you, are you comfortable with the language, adding this language? Um, should there be additional language that says required documentation? I mean, uh, what, how do you interpret that? Is it they, if it's lawfully acquired, they're going to have to have the records just to prove that they purchased it, right? Correct. Okay. Do you think that this language gets you there? You're not going to have any issues there. Yeah, we haven't had issues to this date with, with this language. You've had this language in other, okay, right. got it. Any other, go ahead. Uh, oh, hey, Commissioner Strom was, okay, Commissioner Howe. Rob, uh, in regards to the, the morning dove uh, and the uh, Eurasian dove, there, there's a lot of difference between those two. And if you had a, like you said, put a, a year-round season on the Eurasian, collared dove, what did you accomplish? You, I mean, what you know what I mean? You didn't accomplish nothing by changing. No, if we go that route, we really don't accomplish anything. Yeah, so I I, th I think we ought to leave it as it is, uh, just leave it as a unprotected species because uh, they are really bad in some areas where Rats. guys got farmland, especially. <laughs> Here we go, round two on the dove again. <laughs> I, uh, I know some ranchers that have, have a, a dove problem, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, uh, of course, the droppings. And, and as Commissioner Howell says, they're easy, easy to distinguish them. And I uh, personally, this is not, uh, this is my own personal opinion that, that I think we just go ahead and treat them like we do 
the pigeon or the the jackrabbit. You know, if if the farmer or someone has a problem with it, just go ahead and shoot it. Or or just um, during bird season, if you want to shoot them, they're they're edible. There's nothing nothing wrong with them. But if you go ahead and and uh, put a season on them, that means that probably you'll have to go ahead and and buy a tag or permit or stamp for that particular thing. And I just my own personal opinion, just just leave them alone and that's, let nature take its course, or we'll help nature, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that, that that's strictly up to this board. I mean, we're I'm not going to adamantly argue one way or the other on it. Chairman uh, Macbeth, yes, Boger for the record. Go ahead. Uh, I have this <laughs> real problem, Rob. If I ran into somebody out the field that claimed to be a sportsman and could tell the difference between a Eurasian dove and a morning dove, I think his license should be revoked on the spot and <laughs> sent to a, the nearest optometrist or something. <laughs> That's ridiculous. There's a mountain of difference between the two. Uh, the, you know, I guess if it's not broke, I, I'm not really in favor of trying to fix it. If they're causing people in the farming industry problems, then uh, if you want to regulate it, have open season there. Over here where we don't see a dozen of them a year, uh, maybe regulated here if they become a nuisance. I mean, there, there's all different kinds of plays, but but boy, if somebody can't tell the difference between this vet and a morning dove, they're in, they're in a, they should take up bowling. <laughs> yeah, for, for us in this room, they're readily distinguishable, but when we have people out there that can't tell the difference between an antelope and an elk, and a deer and an elk, and a cow elk and a bull elk, and a doe and a buck. <laughs> Commissioner McNinch. Uh, Rob, I, and I completely agree with uh, Commissioner Vogler's comments about the the fox and, and the fact that you know foxes are pretty uh, they're pretty efficient predators, especially when it comes to, to some of these birds, like especially sage grouse. Is that primarily what's prompting this? Correct. Okay. And they're that, expanding range. There's, they're expanding they're, what, they're range. well populated within the state now. So doing the localized management as part of a population management unit scheme doesn't isn't practical. Correct. Be what you said. Yeah, they're they've taken hold here fairly well. Yeah, I know that they're out. There. Okay. Any uh, is this one, we haven't gone out to public on this, have we? Nope. Okay. Let's go out to public real quick. See. What, Mr. Dixon, Dr. Dixon. Oh, we got cards. Hold on a second. We have cards. You have cards. We're going to do, do the cards first. I think first. cards are a better idea. We have cards. William Chamberlain. They're just eat. Kit Fox. I'm Bill Chamberlain with the United States Wolf Refuge. Uh, getting back to species identification questions that this arose in rightly. Uh, I need to add, Rob, how are you going to apply this particular regulation to what species? At this point in time, genetically, we can't differentiate between a domestic dog, a wolf dog, or a wolf. And if a particular individual claims his animal to be a dog, can you apply that regulation? <laughs> and without that being able to be legally differentiated, uh, law enforcement becomes rather handcuffed. Uh, the other issue is um, the uh, wolf is such a controversial thing that I want to make sure that education with this group and the Rob and his group is extensive. We have been dealing with these animals for 27 years, biologically, ecologically, and politically. There has never been an animal that has caused so much controversy countrywide than the wolf. And so if there's any clarification that this body or any other agency needs, we have got the expertise to share that with you. Uh, Walt Mandeville, Lyon County uh, Board. Uh, we discussed it at length here the other night, and the, uh, the board talked about a lot of different issues, including the difference between a morning dove and a Eurasian collared doves. I didn't even know what they were until the last couple of years. I've had a number of them on my property. And I kept wondering where these guys are coming from. And then my neighbor turned them loose, you know, and because they, you know, occasionally you see some collared doves too, or ringnecks rather. 
which is fairly similar. But the problem that we have with de uh, regulating these is that, uh, I don't know, it would probably be a smaller harvest, I would guess, than if they were just left alone and uh, people could uh, harvest them at any time of the year. I don't know what they are to eat. Are they good to eat? Does anybody know? <laughs> I mean, pigeons, you know what pigeons are. And young pigeons are doggone good to eat. And they use them for these pigeon shoots and stuff, or they used to, until they shut them down. But they do pigeon shoots around the country and other places. So that's kind of a sport. But uh, same thing with the fox. And we did receive a, a one or two letters from people that were concerned about the Sierra red fox, which they do exist, but uh, very small numbers. And so there was concern there. And I was a bit surprised to hear that red fox had become a problem. I do know that they're very adaptable and they can adapt to these, uh, these housing communities quite readily and start taking house cats and small dogs. So they can definitely be a problem, but I can see the possibility of uh, issuing a depredation permit or having wildlife services take care of the problem if it does exist. And our vote was to leave the regulation as is for the European dove and the uh, red fox. So that's what we had uh, voted on. Okay, thank you. Jim. Jim Curran, Churchill County Advisory Board. Uh, we had, like most of the counties, had a fairly lengthy discussion on both the red fox and the Eurasian dove. There's the Eurasian dove. One thing I don't believe, uh, although uh, Commissioner Shum, I believe, might have mentioned just now, by making it a up and game bird would require every hunter basically to have an up and game stamp. So all of a sudden, here'd be another species that would be added to the list unless this is postponed for until the next session of the legislature and be added to the exempt list. I think it's uh, 502, uh, NRS 502, that now exempts the turkey and the crow from having a requirement where you have to have an up and game stamp to hunt. So if you look at it, if you combine it with a morning dove hunt, that's pretty much going to mean every dove hunter in the state is going to have to go get an upland game stamp for another 10 bucks. You know, that's good for the department, but that's not good for the sportsman. I mean, there's no intent. Here's an ex exotic invader coming into the state that we want to control and have to require all the sportsmen in the state to put out another 10 bucks just so they can shoot them. I think that's, that's wrong. There's one other action in NAC that should be changed before this is ever upgraded to a uh, up a game. Or, and I brought this to Rob's attention last week. Is individuals who have chucker, pheasant, and quail as a hobby in their pen in their backyard now are exempt from having an, a non-commercial wildlife possession permit. They're exempt. Uh, we, we did that back in 1997 to save the department from having to do all these $5 permits. If this is made an, a game bird, up in game bird, that it would not be exempt. So anybody like myself that has ring neck dove, Eurasian dove in their pen right now, I would now have to go get an up, a non-commercial upland game or non-commercial wildlife possession permit just to, to make them legal. My chucker and my pheasant are exempt, but all of a sudden, so I think we're really putting the cart before the horse if you take an action tomorrow to make this an up and game bird. It's going to cost all the sportsmen in the state to hunt dove an extra 10 bucks, which is ridiculous. We don't put any money into uh, managing and doing water developments for the Eurasian dove. And uh, also it would affect all the hobby people who have up and game birds now would now have to get a permit where they have been exempt for years. Uh, Churchill County also on the Red Fox, 
Uh, for the last 30 years, I've I have run the Nevada Trapper Association for sale. I probably have handled more Nevada red fox and red fox from all over the country than uh, anyone else in the state. And except for one individual fox that was found dead up above Verdi around 20 years ago, I would, I think, solidly say that all the red fox that now we're seeing are invaders from both Utah and Idaho. There's a complete color uh, variation between your eastern, uh, eastern United States red fox, the cherry reds, and possibly what they call the Sierra Nevada red fox, which I don't think there's very sound evidence even exists, uh, which is a very dark cherry red. Uh, Utah and or Eastern Oregon and Idaho red fox are completely different, and that's what we're seeing now moving into the state, uh, primarily north of Highway 50, but they'll be uh, probably within years, you know, over here in the western part. Say, so I'm only aware of one red fox that I've ever examined, taken, say, in Washoe County or in the western part of the, along the Sierra front that would have any potential influence from uh, a Sierra Nevada red fox. In fact, this one that was found dead uh, had quite a bit of rub mark on its collar, like it might have had a collar, a domestic pet. And at that time, there were quite a few fox as pets here in Nevada. So it may not have even been a wild fox. But I think between the Eurasian dove and this red fox, uh, Churchill County totally supports the delisting of the red fox and would recommend a postponement De indefinitely of the Eurasian dove because of the ramifications of that classification requiring a license uh, two different permits. Thank you. Tom Cassinelli. You're Just next. I'm not a color deaf to you. They did have Tom get up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> He's played hard on me up here. I don't have eyes in the back of my head. See, you think you get them all the time? For the record, Tom Cassinelli representing Humboldt County. Um, Humboldt County discussed this in length too, and um, we we agreed with all the re department's rec recommendations except the Eurasian collared dove. Um, we feel it's kind of an, inda an invasive species that has moved in here, and um, we feel there's that a season would protect it a little more so, and um, there's just no reason for it. I've watched in Paradise Valley when I moved there in 1971. We didn't have a pigeon around in that valley, and there was a few people that bred them there, and they let a few go. And if you look through that country now, the pigeons uh, on these farms, there's just tremendous numbers of them on every, every place you go around there. And I see this, the Eurasian doves starting the same pattern. There's a few now, and every year they increase, almost double. They've about doubled on my place every year, and I can see a a pattern of maybe having a big problem in the future with them. Um, they're not a migratory animal. They, they stay where they're at. And, um, on these ranches and farms, I think if you had the opportunity to, to get rid of them throughout the year, it would benefit. And, and there would be no negative impact to any other species. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Paul, you're up. Oh, please. Can I get up now? Okay. Yes. For the record, uh, Paul Dixon uh, representing Clark County. Uh, our cab, when it got to these, this agenda item, spent also a considerable amount of time. We uh, had uh, David Fifner. Uh, Rob group down there is a lieutenant, I think. Captain. And we went over the legal reasons of why we'd want to make this hunt in Upland Game, you know, make this uh, the Europe, your European collar dove as part of an upland game bird. And I think that we were able to argue almost convincingly of the reasons why not to. I think one of the things that, at least in the south, we have a lot of people, uh, maybe you guys have them up here in the north, but in the south there are a lot of these doves in the Moapa, Overton area. And the game wardens find it hard when they go out because guys will have unplugged shotguns during dove season, but they say they're hunting the European collared doves, so they don't need to have a plug. And our solution to that is, is you know, if you have a morning dove on your possession, you better have a plug in your shotgun. If you don't, you're getting a ticket. But if you don't have a morning dove in your possession, then you can have anything. I mean, you can hunt cottontails, 
at a certain time of the year, but jackrabbits year-round, same difference. I mean, how do you know if somebody's hunting a cottontail or a jackrabbit until they have one in possession? So we were pretty much very much against of listing this bird as a game bird just because of the numbers. And Commissioner Schrum was at the meeting, and, and he mentioned that these birds uh, nest three or more times a year. And I was wondering, Ken, or does anybody biologically know about these birds in that light? I, only what I've read so far, you know, morning doves under right conditions uh, c can breed every month of the year, especially in the southern Nevada, southern California, the desert country. And I, I suspect that the Eurasian doves can do similar, given the resources and the right weather, uh, they can multiply fairly, fairly fast. And as someone said, they don't seem to migrate like uh, the morning dove do as well, as well. And yet nobody said if they taste good, so I'm not sure if shooting them. I, I suspect it. that they're just like a morning dove. You put a little bacon on the barbecue will be good. <laughs> quite, quite edible? <laughs> okay. Uh, lastly, when it came, so because of those things and the fact that what was sent out was just the regulation with the changes, we felt that the commission should table until there was further discussion if you wanted it from Southern Nevada on this, because I really didn't have enough information to have a meaningful discussion outside of what we had as to what you were going to be basing why we were going to be basing things. And again, David Fifner said, you know, as captain, he said, this is what I know, but I'm not the expert. You'd have to wait to get to Reno. Along the same lines, we got to, to the Red Fox. Uh, I have two avid trappers on my board that know a tremendous about, about fox and other things, and, and the Red Fox in particular. Uh, in other states, Red Fox are a major nuisance problem for sheep, people who raise sheep. And Commissioner Vogler may know this or not, but Red Fox are actually take more sheep in South Dakota than do coyotes. So, I mean, if that's, that's a pretty amazing thing. So getting red fox established here where we haven't had them traditionally other than the High Sierra ones, I'm not sure delisting them is the best way to do this or whether we leave it in season because we don't have something and whether we do it through depredation. But again, without somebody in the audience in Southern Nevada to give us more information directly what was driving this regulation change, we felt that it was something that you should table and bring back out with more details of why you needed it, or it would be made on decisions of people up here because we just didn't have the facts in hand with what you gave us. Thank you. Okay. Gil, come on up. For the record, Gil Yana, Carson Advisory Board. Our board was happy with everything, the recommendations of the department except the Eurasian collar dove. We definitely feel it should not be changed its status. Uh, and if people have a problem with identification, then it's just like, you know, you learn to be a duck hunter, you learn to d differentiate between the different species. And if you're gonna go out after collared dove or Eurasian, you know, morning dove, or Eurasian dove, you better learn it. Otherwise, we got procedures to take care of that if you don't. Uh, Don, come on up. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Commissioners Don Moldy, Reno. Uh, this uh, item, this red fox item, got me uh, going at the cab meeting the other night, and I've apologized to Mr. Reed for my conduct uh, there, but then it occurred to me it's a dangerous thing to do because there are a lot of meetings I should apologize for. So I think uh, that's my last apology. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know why you're doing, why we're doing this. There aren't very many red foxes in the state, and I use your own data. This is Endow's data, trapping data. In the last 10 years, there have been a total of 67 red foxes trapped in Nevada in 10 years. Last year, there were four. So if the trappers are telling you there are a bunch of red foxes around, they're not telling the department, which is one of the obligations of their license, isn't it? Uh, so something doesn't make sense here, and I think actually there aren't very many red foxes uh, because there's no evidence to show there is, and I've just shown you a reason to think there is not. Uh, so the only reason I can come up with that this uh, regulation uh, is to be uh, considered is because some people don't like the animal. And I'm not sure that that's a very good argument for deciding how the animal is to be killed and to remove classification from it and to place it in the same category as a Mormon cricket. I'm not sure that's how decisions should be made about animals in this state. And actually, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, 
by the way, that was a comment at the CAB meeting. Uh, I, I had the impression from a comment made that somewhere in the department, we decided that this animal should not come into the state. I don't know who we was, but we was the term that was used. That didn't include me. I never got a vote. So at any rate, since I missed your uh, discussion in September on the uh, North American wildlife conservation model, I thought maybe, uh, I, I'm sorry I missed it, because it must have been an interesting one from the comments I've heard. I thought I would bring a part of that model to this discussion, the Seven Sisters. I'm sure you're familiar with the Seven Sisters. These are the under, underpinnings of the model. And see how this um, recommendation fits with the Seven Sisters of the North American Wildlife Conservation Model. The first, in case you haven't committed these all to memory, I have them here. Uh, the first sister, the public trust. Basically, wildlife belongs to everybody, including me. So clearly, the red fox fits under that heading, I would think. Sister number two, prohibition on commerce of dead wildlife. Doesn't make any sense. Democratic rule of law. That's sister number three. Now, I don't know how that fits this recommendation. I don't know that there's any public clamoring for the killing of red fox. I've seen no such thing in the newspapers. I'm unaware of any public polls to that effect. The department has presented no data on numbers or damage. I've seen no wildlife services reports on red fox damage. So <clears throat> I'm wondering how this recommendation fits uh, sister number three. I don't think it does. Uh, item, sister number four, hunting opportunity for all. Well. You know, uh, seems like a trapping season uh, would provide that opportunity for those who wanted to hunt. This recommendation is not necessary uh, under item number four. Number five, non-frivolous use. That gets kind of close to what I'm concerned about, which is killing an animal because we don't like it. I sort of think that's in a, a form of frivolous use. I could, I could see it that way. So I, I would suggest uh, sister number five might be violated by this proposed regulation. Sister number six, International Resources Act, <clears throat> doesn't fit. Sister number seven, scientific management. Where is there any science in this recommendation? Show me some science. There is no science. If you go on your website and look for supporting information, there is no science. You have presented no science. The department has presented no science. The only thing we have presented, you have presented, not you personally, but what I've heard, <clears throat> is that we don't like the animal. I don't think that that fits the North American wildlife conservation model, Mr. Chairman. And I would submit that this is something that shouldn't be done. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Any uh, other public comment? Come on up. John Reed, Washoe Cab. Uh, for obvious reasons, Mr. Chairman, you can see that Dr. Moldy is more than welcome at our cab meetings at any time. <laughs> but uh, I'm digressing because what I want to talk about was this uh, wolf thing. Um, to varying degrees, we are not excited about having wolves in Nevada, uh, the five of us on the board anyway. And when I read this. It says, except as otherwise provided, uh, the following animals may be possessed, transported, imported, and exported without a permit or license issued by the department. And that includes wolves that are lawfully acquired and bred in captivity. Notwithstanding what the chief game warden said, it sounds like we are loosening things up for people to own wolves. Um, regardless of how they got them, if you get a pregnant wolf and she gets away, which they uh, evidently are genetically predisposed to do. Uh, they want to be free and they're not really domesticable. Um, we felt like that was loosening up the law rather than tightening it. And we would like to ma maintain control over wolves and uh, those sorts of species if, as they arise. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comment? Chief, did you want to respond to something? Yeah, with me, uh, again, for the record, uh, Chief Game Warden Rob Bonamici. Uh, with regards to the Eurasian collar dove, we acquiesce. <laughs> <I don't. laughs> uh, <laughs> 
So, so that one's handled. Uh, with regards to the the the, the wolves, uh, the first comment made regarding genetics and so forth. That's why we didn't tie this to genetics or anything. It's just that uh, that are lawfully acquired and bred in captivity. So it would take an investigation on our part to show that the animal was not lawfully acquired, i.e. taken out of the wild, or taken illegally, sold illegally in another state, or what have you, and bred in captivity. So it's, that's how we would do the investigation. We wouldn't be taking blood to say, hey, this is 100% wolf, this is you know 90% or what have you. So, so that's just to clarify that. With regards to these critters, any of these critters listed here, escaping, it's incumbent, it's in law, that the person who has them in captivity must report an escape to us. It's also in law that we may destroy that animal when we find it. So there are provisions in law to address those situations. So I just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Mr. Chairman, could I make yeah, a comment? Ahead. I've been sitting here debating whether I was going to say anything or not, and Chief Gilbertson can keep me honest here, but um, I appreciate what uh, Dr. Moldy had to say about the, the red fox. I can tell you from my California experience that the uh, red fox in California, not the Sierra Nevada red fox, which is a native and is threatened, or endangered, excuse me, um, has caused more problems with native wildlife in California than any other species I can think of. Um, there's, uh, they, they're very, very good predators. They're from the east primarily. Um, the, the two species that we're looking at here are concerned about are the eastern red foxes getting established, especially in, the, um, in Nevada, as well as the, the Rocky Mountain uh, subspecies, which are not native to, to, um, uh, to, to Nevada. And so thinking from a native wildlife perspective, that's the, you know, the science, uh, yeah, there's very few, but quite frankly, we really wouldn't want the, that's this alien species in our mind established in the state, which will cause to have a ripple effect with other native wildlife in, in Nevada. That's why we kind of came forward with this proposal. Okay. I'll bring it back to the commission. Uh, any uh, comment on uh, on this uh, uh, CGR? Chairman McBeth, thank both of you for the record. Go ahead, Hank. Uh, again, with the red fox, Mr. Mayor is absolutely right. It doesn't take but a pair to be very efficient with the sachin. And if it wasn't for the different groups using the sachin as a tool, not necessarily for, to preserve the sachin or other nest, ground nesting birds, but as a tool to eliminate uses of public land, whether it be grazing or mining, it could dramatically affect the northern <clears throat> counties uh, and the mining industry and the livestock industry all together could be hurt dramatically. Now, as a result of all of the hype that's in the newspapers, there's a lot of red foxes out there that are being taken that are not reported that probably wind up on a stretcher and wind up going to shows in Idaho and other places just because he wants to be responsible because nobody really knows it is defined that well or nobody has really looked it up because you don't see a slug of them. You just see a few of them and so then all of a sudden it gets a little dicey of what you've got and I really appreciate Endow wanting to define this animal and what it is because it is an invasive species, it is a pest. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Okay. Well, thank you everybody for that. That was that one was very informative. Um, okay. Two, five. Five. What's that? Five. Take five. Oh, take five. Okay. Now take a five minute break.